Well, today we have a very special day, and that is New Year. And already Winkit has given you all the the fat food, fat toy, and everything else that needs to go with fat, all right? But the thing is that today I want to also, as a start, give you something much better, which already Susan has said, and that is I want to give you God's blessings. Sunday morning, yana. Receive God's blessings during the new year, right? Not only the riches and all that goes with it, but with it comes blessings. And uh, this is what it is that we desire from God today, okay? So therefore, I wish every one of you to receive the Lord's blessings. Sunday morning, yan. Now, during this year now, we are coming to uh, the practically the end of uh, January. And so one month nearly has gone by. Now, during this one month, have you ever kind of thought through what kind of vision that you have for the year? What is your vision for this year that you have that you would like to, uh, to, to achieve? What is the desire of your heart? And uh, you know what? Um, there are many, many already uh, puns that are going on. I'm so sorry, wait, my uh, clicker, yes. There are many puns that have gone round, and one of the puns is that uh, do, this year is 2020, and the, the, the one that says 2020, my friend, my good classmate says, yeah, this year 2020, I must come back and celebrate, because before I get too old, too old. And then there was one, one I, I think some of you would have gotten... Uh, uh, this viral um, uh, uh, WhatsApp that has gone by. Because, uh, just to let you know first, my theme for this year is to look at 2020 vision. God's vision for 2020. So when you say 2020, well, the thing is this. Whether you want to be too old, too old and just uh, fade away like this, or do you want to be too old, too old, but still you are able to do this? Come on. Run away, read really. Ah, that's how it is. Because I think that uh, people like us, uh, old folks, uh, we are always saying, uh, old folks, uh, they, they, we, we, we want to kind of like, a, you know, um, no, no energy, no nothing. But I tell you, we have more energy than many young people nowadays. Because young people nowadays, they have much energy with their thumbs. But we have much energy with our legs. We go everywhere. Okay? So, which are we? How do we look at it? And there is this uh, viral um, WhatsApp that has gone by. And it says this. We are in the year too old, too old. Pursue your dreams and do what you always want to do this year. Because next year is too old to want. And then after that, it's too old to do. And so therefore, if we are looking at this, then uh, which year are you in? Too old to do or too old to want? Or you are just getting on and really run with your age. It doesn't matter how old you are. Amen? And uh, you see, when we look at vision, how do we see vision? Eh? Because like I say, my, 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 uh, my, my title is, we need a 2020 vision. You know what is a 2020 vision? Well, the American uh, Academy of Ophthalmology, yeah, I got it correct, Ophthalmology, it states this, that a person with a 2020 vision can see what an average individual can see on an eye chart when they are standing 20 feet away. Okay? Now, when it comes to vision, obviously, distance makes a huge difference. I can see Eileen at the back there. I can see a lot of people at the back also. But you go further, it's very difficult to see because your vision... It's too large, too long, you see. But a, but a 2020 vision, that means that I can see any of you, no problem, okay? And so therefore, we are, uh, uh, as we look at this, you see, how do we, sometimes, you know, when we get old, then our eyes get a little bit blurred and so on, and we say we have a cataract. And our dear sister there has done her cataract operation, and now she can have a vision that can run on. You know, no problem now, can see, right? And many of us who have had cataract operations, you know what it is like. You know, last time when we had cataract operation, we fear, uh, you know, and we tremble to go in because we have to go for a real operation. Nowadays, 
搞掂 ready， fit 搞掂 ready。One week you come out, huh? You are to 2020 vision nearly, right? So therefore, these are technologies that have gone on. So as far as we are concerned, how do we look at our spiritual vision? What has it that God has given to us? You know, have we considered that as we look at this kind of vision? Previously, you see, our vision with God is very far away, isn't it? We consider the space between us and God. And the way we see the world is very different because before we know God is far, far away. Everything is、uh, is quite blurred, and we are pursuing our own vision. But as far as now, you see, when we come before God, we are saved by grace through faith, and in the salvation of our、uh, of、uh, of our soul, then what happens is that、uh, that sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross when He died. It closes that gap between us and God. Now we can see God. Last time, do you call God Father or not? God Father, God lah, down below one lah, the other one lah, God Father lah. But we never call God Father. But because of the fact that we are now closer to God, because we are now saved by grace and we are part of God's children, we can come and call God Father. And God is our Father because now we can see Him, we know Him because we have the Word of God with us. And so, as we look at God's vision, what is God's vision for each one of us? What is God's vision for the church? Are we object? Or are we kind of achieving the kind of objectives that we set out to do? What is God telling us these days? What is God telling us these days with all the things that are going on in the world today? What is God telling us? And in the Bible, there's a passage that contains perhaps one of the most dramatic、uh, vision correction of all times. And perhaps we would like to turn with me to Acts chapter nine. Acts chapter nine, and I would like to read to you because、uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful、uh, passage, and I've had so much inspiration just looking at、uh, Acts chapter nine. This is where you are, Acts chapter nine, and I'm going to read you this passage. You say, "Wow, so long one!" No, it's not long. The Bible is 66 books. You read it, and、uh, you get much more. But 20 verses is nothing. So I'll read to you now in the revised,、uh, uh, rather in the New King James Version. Acts chapter nine, from verse one, and you know who we are talking about. Then Saul. Breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, or he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near the Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, "Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me?" And he said, "Who are you, Lord?" And the Lord said, "I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats." And so he, trembling and astonished, said, "Lord, what do you want me to do?" And the Lord said to him, "Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do." And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Verse ten. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street called Straight. And isn't this fantastic? Not a crooked street, a straight street. Yeah. And、uh, here he says, "Go to a, and、um, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, 'O、oh、Lord, I have heard from many about this man.'" How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, "Said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, 
kings and the children of Israel. For I must, I, for I will show him how much, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went on his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with his disciples at Damascus. And verse 20 says, Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. The Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer together. Our Father God, we want to offer this time to you. We want your strength to be with us. We want your wisdom to just uh, come and teach us your word and, that, uh, and allowing us, O oh God, during this time as we look forward to this year 2020, that it will be a year of blessing. That it will be a year where God, you can work in each one of our hearts. That God, we will generate from within. Lord, you will generate from within our hearts that desire to serve you in the things that you have given to us. To use our talent wisely for the glory of God. So Father, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You see, this is a passage where Saul of Tarsus had an encounter with God that radically transformed his vision. And before Saul's encounter with God, what did he have? He had a distorted, a clouded vision. You know why? Because you see, this, this guy Saul... Actually, he was first mentioned in Acts chapter 7. If you look into Acts chapter 7, right, you will find that there, referring to Stephen's martyrdom, what happened? They cried out with a loud voice. Acts chapter 7, verse 57, 58, it says, They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And it says that, that the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man, Named Saul. Man, man, Saul was not an old man. Saul at that time was in the prime of his life, a young man, right? And so, therefore, then you come to chapter 8, verse 1. It tells us that Saul was consenting to Stephen's murder. And then the word consenting, right, literally means to willingly approve of what was being done, delight in what was being done to Stephen. In other words, he was willingly approving the killing and the murder of Stephen uh, at that time. And then we come to Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And there are two facts, right? We read that first again, because I think this is where it reminds us what is happening. Because then Saul, he says in verse 1 and 2, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked the asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he might, that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And here, there are two facts that we need to see. And that is, firstly, Saul was breathing threats and murder against Christ and his disciples at that time. And the Greek word for breathing that is there, the in Saul's case, what does it mean? It meant that he was actually taking into his heart this evil thing of, uh, of destruction, of a phenomenon that he could not understand. He can't understand why. He can't understand, you know, like one commentator said, he said that Saul could not understand how these believers could suffer such extreme persecution. And yet, holding fast onto their faith. He couldn't understand why they were doing that. If I were to persecute them, they should surely, you know, repent and come back and they will surely uh, 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 get rid of uh, what they have learned and come back, come back into the religion that he was in. And so therefore, he could not understand. And in his, uh, and in his quest for destruction of these people, what he did was, the fact was that he had a vision that was clouded in anger. He was very angry with the disciples. He was very angry with those who were doing, uh, uh, who were going, uh, um, the way of Jesus. 
And then secondly, secondly, Saul was completely given over to one objective, very fierce objective, and that is to destroy the followers of the way of the Lord. He wanted to destroy the followers of the way of the Lord. And so therefore, what did he do? He volunteered. He volunteered. He went to the Sanhedrin, to the high priest. And he requested for letters of authority to go to the synagogues in, in uh, uh, Damascus. And the letter of authority is that anyone who gets into the way, who is in the way, in the synagogue, bring them out. We will chain them and bring them to uh, chain them and lead them back for trial in Jerusalem. And of course, those who resisted, I'm sure he would have murdered them. He would have killed them. And so therefore, he, wa he wanted to utterly destroy and stamp out what he felt was a threat. A threat, this preaching of Christ. And Saul saw it as a threat because, you see, he had a, a threat to what? It was a threat to his religion. His old religion that he is a Pharisee and his, his religion was Judaism at that time. Judaism, he was a Pharisee, like I say. So he became the leader of this persecuting the church. He became a leader simply because he could not understand and he don't want anybody to get out of Judaism because that is his religion. And so therefore, it was a vision that I see that was clouded by the past that he was still stuck with his religion. He was still stuck with the old way. He was not willing to go on to the new way. He was not willing to see for himself this way, whether it's good or bad. He just wanted it in such a manner that he will kind of annihilate all of those and all of them must come back into one road and that is the road of Judaism. Friends, of course we know Stephen's martyrdom had a lot of effect. On, uh, on the people and especially in Jerusalem also and in all the other places what happened was the, the, the believers were scattered all over the place and in this scattering of the believers uh, uh, of the way we call it uh, of the way what happened is well, it was God's way of scattering the church of Jerusalem that began the work of evangelism in accordance with the great commission because they were very very comfortable at that time uh, that the disciples were in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, contented, comfortable, and they were able to kind of worship God there in Jerusalem, and they were listening to the apostles' teachings, and everything was going on very well, with no thought of going out elsewhere to preach the Word of God. And you know, sometimes we do get very comfortable with all the uh, different programs that we have within the churches. You know, every church has their own program. I'm not saying the programs are no good. They are good. But the thing is that you see our main vision. What is it that God has given to us? That is important. And so therefore, they were doing a good job in Jerusalem actually at that time. They were evangelizing those in Jerusalem. They were giving, distributing to the poor. They were bringing everything together. Everybody selling their goods, bringing it together in a community. It was a community of believers, very happy and very active within Jerusalem itself, but nothing outside. And that is where the scattering came about. And the scattering was such that they were all scattered all over. But you remember what it was? That when they were scattered, they did not hide. They did not go underground. They came out stronger and they preached the gospel where they were. Everywhere they went, they were preaching the gospel. He, they were not afraid. They were not afraid of the persecution. They may be scattered, but they are not afraid. Brothers and sisters, when we get, when we get in a position of persecution, are we afraid? Do we hide? If people make fun of us, do we kind of poo poo and, eh, and uh, leave it like that? Or do we get onto it and say, hey, look, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and this is my Lord. You can do whatever you want. You, this is what you can say. My testimony and my action and the way that I live my life is a life that I dedicate to God. How do we see our lifestyle? How do we see our lifestyle? You know, in the Jerusalem, miracles are happening. And yet, you see, even those disciples in Jerusalem, they had this clouded vision. That clouded vision whereby they were only interested in their own circle. They were not going out. And so therefore, what is happening? I believe that God really is calling the church to be on the move. We are one of those churches that are on the move. Yes. 
we are going out. Yes. But more than that, I believe that God wants us to do something that is really out of, uh, think out of the box. Do something that perhaps we have never thought about. I don't know yet because I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just giving you some, uh, some ideas whereby perhaps we can do something where we have never done before. Because we don't want to wait for persecution to come. We don't want to wait for persecution. Persecution will come. But if we wait for persecution, I think it's a little bit too late. You know? So we must also understand this. Are we therefore a follower of Jesus or are we a member of a church only? It's a big difference. If you are just a member of a church, we come here, we do our tithes, we do our offerings, we do our worship, we do our listen to a sermon, we tell the pastor how good the sermon is, the next day we forget all about it. And then come back the next week. And we go through the same motion. But if we really are interested to do the work of God, if we are really interested to be followers of Jesus, Jesus says, go into all the world and touch life, transform life. But first of all, is our own life transformed? Sometimes our lives need transformation. We need a different vision. We need to do a cataract operation, spiritual cataract, just like Paul. I saw, I'll tell you as we go along. Because I want to go into one other thing first before I go into the next uh, point. Because these early churches, they, the believers, they were known as followers of the way. They were not a religion. Jesus never started a new religion. Jesus never started a set of rules and regulations. If you examine scripture, you will, follow, you will find that the way meant the way of life, the way of living, the way of how God would want us to live according to God's design before man lost his way. And the way, Dr. Liu, he wrote this, the way is the way of salvation. Because in Acts chapter 16, verse 17, he says, she, and that is the slave girl at that time, following after Paul and, and us, and kept screaming and shouting, these are the servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. The way is a way of salvation. It's not a way of religion. And then also, it was also a way of truth. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And many will follow the destructive ways because, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. We need to know that it's the way of truth. It's not a way of anything else. Whatever blasphemy, whatever comes along. You see, we are not following all the rest of things. We are following the way of truth. Then thirdly, we, we know that it's a way of righteousness because a uh, little bit on, you will find in Peter chapter 2, 21. It says, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. That's the way that God has given to us by, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then having no need to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It was a way of righteousness. That is what God is trying to teach us. That's what Jesus is trying to give to His disciples at that time. And then, because Jesus came, it was also a way of peace. In Luke chapter 1, verse 79, to, what does uh, the prophecy say about Jesus? To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. You know, many of us don't have peace. Do you know that? Many of us are not peaceful people. Many of us have got a lot of things deep down within her that kind of every day, you know, it's uh, worrying us. You know, during my days when I was in business, every day when I get up, I'm thinking where to get money to pay my, my, my workers. When, where am I going to get business to get my, 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 uh, my, um, my business going on? Where am I going to do all these things? And my mind is never, never at peace because of the fact that, you see, all these things come in to cloud our way. But when we come into the Lord Jesus Christ and understand what God is teaching us, we say, God, we leave it to you. You know better than us. And when I came into the, 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 the ministry also, you know, it is not that uh, it is uh, simply just, uh, oh, okay, yeah, but I, and I walk into the ministry. I don't do that because as far as I'm concerned, I struggle. I struggle to get into the ministry because this is not something that I want. But God says, this is the way I want you to do. And when I went in there, it became a way of peace for me because whatever I said, whatever questions that I have, just like the, 
the, uh, the Israelites I was reading Exodus this morning. And whatever the complaints that they have, whatever it is, how am I going to get out? And so on. One million over people going across, coming out. But you see, God gave them that peace. God gave to Moses, uh, 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 most important, that peace to lead the people. And when, so therefore, you see, all these things are such that we need to understand God's way is a way of peace. And God's way is a way of righteousness for all of us. And so therefore, these are what Jesus pointed His disciples to consider. It's not to consider uh, how to uh, build a new religion, how to have a set of rules, and how to get your church going, and all the rest of it. It was a dynamic living way that Jesus gave to His disciples. A way whereby we touch hearts and we transform lives, bringing them back to God, transforming their lives so that their lives can become different, that they can show others that I can live in all that I have and I can be joyful. You know, this is what uh, we've been singing uh, this, this morning, a whole morning. We can be joyful. In times of sorrow, we can still be joyful. In times of persecution, we can still be joyful. Not that you go out, ha, 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 you know, like a madman. But inside, that's a joy that I have peace, that I have the righteousness, I have God with me, and I can be at peace and I can be joyful as far as my life is concerned. It's not different. It's, it's that people look at us, how can you be like that? Huh? In the midst of all these things, I said, I have Jesus. I have Jesus. And then I can sh- challenge them, do you have Jesus? Why is your life so, uh, uh, so kind of topsy turvy? Because you don't have Jesus. It's a way of evangelizing. Isn't it? And so therefore, we use every opportunity that we have to bring people back. So the next thing, uh, Saul, what he had to do, he had to undergo vision correction. Just like laser treatment. Ah. He, because his clouded vision is there, see, God had to collect, co- uh, correct his vision. You see, Damascus was not very near Jerusalem. Damascus was 140 miles from Jerusalem. And it would take that party of people about a week to travel there. And they don't go very far, very, 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 um, they, they don't go very fast. They don't have uh, jet planes, they don't have uh, Ferraris, they just walk. And during that time, the other thing is that though his companions, the officers from the Sanhedrin, was going with him, he would not mix with them because he's a Pharisee, and a Pharisee will keep to himself, only to his own uh, community of Pharisees they would mix. Other than that, they would keep to themselves. Paul was walking along with all his uh, officers and he was alone. And during that time as he walked, I wonder what he was thinking. You know, I would think, I'm going there and I've got a few churches that I want to go to, all these synagogues, and I'm going to see where they are. I'm going to get the chief uh, um, uh, chief rabbi there and I'm going to bring them out and I'm going to ask them to point to me which one. And then when, once I get there, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to chain them and bring them and get them all together and herd them like a, like, like a herd of horses or goats or sheep and I'm going to drag them back to Jerusalem. You know, in his mind, he was having all these kind of things going on. And so, what happened? He had plenty of time. And when they were nearing Damascus, suddenly something happened. Something happened. There was a bright light that appeared unexpected from nowhere from, uh, from, from heaven and it shone upon him. And it shone upon him. And Saul saw this supernatural light shining down and he was struck to the ground and he heard this voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I, I'm not sure how he looked at it, but I believe that in his heart he's really frightened, fearful of what was going on. Why are you persecuting me? Who am I persecuting? I'm persecuting anybody. Who's that? You know? And then his, he perceived that this was from heaven. And he said, Who are you, Lord? He's no longer who are you. He said, Who are you, Lord? Ha! Ah, and Jesus began to tell him all the things that was wrong. And we know the rest of the story of Saul's conversion. I don't need to go into that because that has gone in uh, uh, very much all of us know. But to me, three important facts that we need to take note. And that is, is in the ensuing dialogue between Saul and, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's happened? Saul had to submit and surrender his will 
and his life to the Lord Jesus' instructions. There and then, there was a transformation within him. Because anger now has turned to fear, it has turned to humility. And so he said in verse 6, trembling, rather, oops, sorry, uh, tram- trembling in verse 6, he said, trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's no longer what I want to do, but Lord, what do you want me to do? And furthermore, when he opened his eyes, he could not see. He was blind. And he had to be led all the way into Damascus. And again, there must have been a lot of soul searching going on deep within him. So then, as I say, the next thing is that the the scene shifted to Ananias, the man of God. And the Lord was using Ananias as an instrument to restore Saul. But Ananias in the beginning was skeptical. He had a very skeptical attitude simply because of what he had heard was going on uh, in, uh, outside. He heard that Saul was uh, the one who was uh, coming to, uh, to, to persecute the church. And he had all those things going on in his mind and he was fearful. God! Lord, what do you want me to do? This guy is like that. You want me to go and visit him? I'll be hung up, man. But you see, what happened is, the Lord said, he is a man to be used. And so therefore, what happened? Skepticism gives way to obedience. It gives way to obedience. He just had to follow what God told him to do. Now sometimes when God speaks to us, we do question God. I've questioned God so many times. But every time, when it comes to the end, I say, Lord, yeah, okay, God will be done. Not mine. It's not what I want to do. But God, if you say so, okay, we'll do it. But of course, we don't do it unwillingly. We do it willingly simply because God has given us an objective. God has given us a vision. God has given us a, a plan. And God has given us this idea to follow His way. And as we follow the way of God, God never fails us. And in my, in, my, in my term, you know, as a pastor, as uh, working outside with, uh, with NECF and now with Focus on the Family, I have not lost my vision. I have not lost my passion. That's why today I can stand here and I can speak. Because that passion comes deep down within. And every year I'm asking the Lord nowadays, what do you want me to do this year? And God has never failed to give me something. Last year, the Lord said, now I go into this one word. He said, wait. I said, wait what? Wait upon me. Wait upon me. And as I waited upon God, God began to show me a lot of things. Uh, God began to knowing, God know me uh, much better than you because I'm a restless person. Yeah, some of you know. Yeah, I can see the smiles on your faces. Because I'm a restless person, I cannot sit still. Man. But you see, God says, wait upon me. Wait. And this year, the Lord said, Another word, rest in me. Wow, that's a bit difficult also. Rest in me. But you see, this is what God wants me to do. Okay, I will do it. And then as I rested upon the Lord and as I kind of spent time with the Lord, the Lord showed me one by one some of the things that are being done. And I said, Lord, can I do that? And you oh, very difficult. The Lord asked me to increase my offering. And I said, God, I don't have very much and you want me to increase my offering. It, it took a bit, of, uh, a, a bit of courage, but I said, Lord, I will obey. But you see, these are things I'm sharing you from my heart because this is what God is telling me. And this is what God wants me. And God still wants me to travel. February, I'm going to Berlis, up all the way. And I'll be spending a bit of time there. But why? It's because God's work is important. And whatever my time is, whatever age that I am, as long as I have the energy, as, I, as, as long as I have the ability, I will go. I will go. Because this is what God wants me to do. And I think for all of us, let us be very much in line with God in our thoughts and do this, this, this new year as we go along into 20020. Have that heart to seek after God and see what God wants you to do. What is it that God wants? What is the vision that God has given to us? It's important, brothers and sisters. And then coming back to Saul, the third thing we see is that he spent three days and nights fasting and in prayer, right? Very solitude, in darkness, and the transformation 
began to take place. He would be thinking through the confrontation and he had to switch his mind and his thoughts, patterns that he had before. He had met the living Jesus. Have you met the living Jesus? Is Jesus living or is Jesus just another person that because of a religion that you are in right now, you are in there because you just want to be part of a passport that you get to go to heaven? It's more than a passport. It's a passport to travel. It's a passport to go from place to place. It's a passport whereby I can go and I can touch lives. That's the kind of passport that I have. So he would have switched. And he would have wondered why Jesus was choosing him. And one who was so fiercely opposing to Jesus. Why is Jesus choosing him? He must have thought. And what a transformation. As soon as Ananias finished speaking in verse 18, it tells us, immediately, immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scale, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. He had a spiritual cataract operation, or glaucoma even, you know, operation. And he could see, and he immediately, he says, it fell from his eyes. And brothers and sisters, have you ever wondered why you and I are sitting here? Why are you sitting here? Do we come just to satisfy, like I say, a religious duty? What purpose has God planned for you? Have you ever asked God? What has God planned for you? But of course, we are, we are looking at the spiritual side, right? More than the physical side. And are there scales perhaps that are blocking your way, whereby you cannot see ahead, where you cannot see where God is leading you? Perhaps it's because these are the clouded vision that you need to come before God and say, Lord, please, take it off so that I can see your purposes in my life. I'm not just a Christian for the sake of being a Christian. I am a Christian because I have a plan or rather I have a purpose here on earth. God has given me a purpose and God has given to each one of us a purpose. And that purpose is to serve Him and the purpose is to go out and touch life for Him. If not, we are, we are wasting our time sitting here. Honestly. 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 I'm speaking honestly simply because of my heart. My heart is really into this real situation where I have gone through and I know what it means to really come out from our fear of serving God. We have the instruments. We are God. God has given us the talents, right? And so therefore, what happened to Saul? Saul was given then a different vision. God gave him a perfect vision. God gave him a perfect vision. Because Saul did not wait to explain or justify his actions. Did you know that? He didn't go and say to the synagogues and say, Hey, you know, yeah, I was like that, but that, blah, blah, and all the rest of it. He didn't need to explain. What he did was this. Was this. In verse 20, he says that immediately, again, that word, immediately, he preached to the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Immediately after he has gone through all that, he opened his eyes and spent a few days with the disciples and he went and he preached the gospel. Now, Damascus actually is a very, uh, yeah, nearly finished. Damascus actually well, has a very large Jewish community. That was why he was interested in Damascus in the first place. And so there were quite a few synagogues in there. That's why he was going to go around into the synagogues. Okay. But there were quite a few synagogues there and Saul had letters of authority to go into all these synagogues to arrest the disciples. Yet, it was to these very synagogues where he had the authority to go and arrest that he went in and he began to preach the gospel. He began to show them immediately what the gospel is all about. And he was able to tell them that Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, what a change. What a change. What a transformation. And what we see is this. He did not waste time. And many of us, perhaps, you know, not here, not here maybe, the church down the road maybe, you know, we waste a lot of time. We waste a lot of time doing things uh, that actually is a waste of time. 
But the thing is that you see, God tells us that don't waste time because time is precious. We are coming to the end of the, the, the ages already, coming near, you know, when the Lord is coming again. Let us not waste time. Let us work while it is day because the night will come when we will not be able to work anymore. Let us work while we are able to until we are so old that we are not able to work anymore. God takes us back. But the thing is that you see, while we are here, do what we can. So brothers and sisters, let me ask you, have you ever had this feeling that you are going about fulfilling your vision when somehow out of the blue the vision is being interrupted? That's what happened to me. When I was in business, I was doing this and that and I was already going very well and I was uh, sure I was going to make my millions and I was going to have my, my Ferrari, I was going to have my Mercedes and all the rest of it. And now all of a sudden, God changes that vision. Interrupted. Like Saul, you have been set a vision a task. And you know that what you want to do or even now doing, but now all of a sudden you cannot see ahead. Because why? God is blocking that vision and God is giving you a new vision. Your old vision is not that it's no good. It's not that uh, there is nothing that, that we, uh, uh, it's not that we in our business, you know, we cannot do. In business, we can still serve the Lord. In business, if that is what God has given to you to do, you serve God at the best where you are in your place of work. But there are certain people, just like Saul, where God takes you out from where you are and puts you into a new position like what He did to me. And I am preaching the gospel. I am not doing other things that, not to say waste time. I am not looking for earthly treasures. God has given me everything. And this is what it is for us that we need to do. Look at it from God's point of view. Don't look at it from, the, from, from our earthly vision. Look at it from God's vision. See what God wants you to do. That is important. Has she ever allowed circumstances or even events to take place with the intended purpose of drawing slowly but surely, drawing your eyes off your planned direction to restore your focus to Him? You know, sometimes we can be so caught up with our own things, so caught up with... Uh, Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to do, do, do as much. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Everybody wants to buy a big house. Everybody wants to buy a big car. All these things come in and we lose our vision where God gives to us. Where are we going? And God has to restore that. God has to change that. God has to bring us back to reality. And that is, you know, our time on earth is a very limited time. Our time on earth is just short time. You may have three score and ten, four score and ten, no problem. You can even five score. You know how much five score is? 100 years. You can have that, but that is even a short time, a little drop in the ocean of time that God has eternity. And so therefore, what is it? It is that, that, that time that God has, that one drop, let it make a ripple. You know, one drop in the ocean, wow, you can see the ripple going out from, from that. You know, just one drop. Now, is your drop making a ripple or it's not even moving? How is your drop in the ocean? Does it make a ripple? Does it make even a little bit of a sensation? I'm trusting that you know each one of us as we look at it, each one of us, God can use us and God can also use our past too. You know, for Paul, uh, this is my ending really, um, Paul, he was a Pharisee. When he went in, he could argue with all the people in the synagogues and argue about Christ and he knows his stuff. He knows his, well, shall, shall we say, his Bible. Okay? He knows all his stuff and God used all this in order that we can have what we have in the epistle. If God didn't, if he was not that kind of a learned person, we would have lost what, 13 or 14 epistles in the Bible. But that is what God has given him, that talent to do. Because he was a Pharisee before. So the thing is, like, what has God given to each one of us? What is that kind of vision? What is it that we can use, you know, as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a, an engineer, whatever it is. How can we use that in order to bring the gospel to other people through your talents? Engineers, like we have heard, you know, Glenn and uh, all the rest, you go across uh, to other places, uh, to, to Myanmar and so on, and you begin that work. And so you see, these are thinking out of the box. And when you think out of the box, this is where God wants us 
to be. Where is your service? Where are you as far as God's vision is concerned? Are you still focused? Or have we lost our way? Some of us perhaps you know, need to really come back to God and say, God, yeah, my time with you is important. My time with you is far more important than anything in the world. And I need to build up my resources so that I can use what I have in order to touch life, tell them about the gospel, teach them about all the things that perhaps I can be a mentor to them in the work that they do. If I'm a lawyer, a younger lawyer comes along, I need to teach them righteousness and how to do all the things and, uh, uh, and, and a lot of other things. And perhaps I can do that. And so God, give me that vision. Give me that strength. Give me that ability to go and be a brother, a sister to another person, perhaps. So therefore, brothers and sisters, may the Lord this morning bless and keep us that our vision can be a 100% 2020 vision for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we are thankful that you are good to us and you have given us so much and God, you have never failed us. We have failed you many, many times. But God, you have never failed us. And you have given us your word. And you have given us your vision for the, for the year. And God, if this is your vision that you have given, Lord, enlarge that vision. Enlarge that tent of ours. Enlarge it so that God, we can be the kind of person that you would want us to be. Father, we just want to submit to you. We commit ourselves to you this, uh, during this time. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you will begin that transformation in our life if we have not been transformed. We give you thanks. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.